Basically, in your book, you compare your life, your career as an Oxford professor, with the less happy life of your cousin. Why have you come up with this story? I'm an economist, and what I'm writing about is how economics has gone wrong and damaged a lot of human lives. Economics is about human life, and um, when it goes wrong, real people suffer consequences. And I wanted to make that graphic. And as it happens, I've lived a life that exemplifies the divides in our society. And so, yes, it's a very personal story. You know, I'm a professional economist at Oxford. It's all proper economics, but um, it's a human story about what has gone wrong and how we can put it right. And I wondered, coming of a very poor background in Sheffield, you get this career as a, an Oxford professor. Would this today still be possible, such an upward move in the social ladder? Very much less likely. I, I was immensely fortunate to benefit from the, that amazing period for about 20 years after 1945, when Britain came together and we built a lot of mutual obligations that transformed prospects for ordinary people. Both my parents had left school when they were 12. I got to a school which had just become a state school um, two years before I was born, and it closed just as I left. It was only there for 20 years. I hit seven of them. You know? I was born in a National Health Hospital two years after the National Health Service was founded. So I was extraordinarily lucky, and it transformed my life. So this was a happy period, but what, what happened? Well, it wasn't a happy period for everybody. Mm. Um, so my cousin was born on exactly the same day as myself, and we both got to good state schools, and then her life diverged from mine quite dramatically through the misfortune of her father dying when she was a teenager, and it was the 1960s, a new culture was emerging, she went off the rails, she became a teenage mother, and these things echo down the generations. So her two daughters themselves both became teenage mothers. Um, and so the, these profound divergences um, have been allowed to happen without adequate public policy to provide safety nets and putting, putting lives back on the rails. And so you, part of the book is about that. Yes, in your book you diagnose that capitalist's biggest trouble is that we have a rift between the elites and the ordinary people, we have a rift between metropolitan areas and the countryside. Um, what has gone wrong? Well, um, as you say, so there's two new rifts opened up. New in the sense it started, we can date it very precisely to around 1980. And it's not just in Britain, it's in most of the, of the major economies. I think Switzerland much less so in terms of both of these divergences, um, because you've done some very good public policies that have counted it. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly in Britain, in America, in France, you get the, the booming metropolis and periodically provincial cities get broken. And the, the force which produces that is, is globalization. There are fewer and bigger winners. Um, and the other big change has been for 200 years until 1980, the gaps between the well-educated and the less well-educated were narrowing. Mm -hmm. And since 1980, they've been widening. Um, and there's no mystery there. The, the price we pay for rising productivity is greater complexity, and complexity needs a good education to manage it. So some people have been left behind because some they don't people have, have got the education. great skills, they've got good education, and they tend to go to the metropolis where they're very valuable, and they've been on an up escalator. And then for 40 years, other people who invested in manual skills um, have been on a down escalator. And so the provincial manual worker has been diverging from the metropolitan well-educated for 40 years, and the result is of that neglect uh, is, is rage, anger, mutiny. Mm -hmm. And we've seen these mutinies around the world. It's Brexit, it's Trump, it's the Gilets Jaunes. 
So the left behind now protest in a way in um, electing populist movements. But yeah. what can be done about it? I mean, is education uh, the big thing? Well, th these two rifts are perfectly healable. We can, we can bring people back together again um, if we choose the right public policies. So, for example, um, healing the education rift really means making the 60% the, the of the population that isn't particularly cognitively gifted, they still have to be productive. Mm. Um, and the Switzerland's done a pretty good job with that. Pretty good job. You've done a really excellent job with vocational training. You can think of what, what I call this social maternalism, a chain from a baby being born mm. through to a, a productive 24-year-old who is motivated to want to contribute to society. And Switzerland's done a really very good job on that chain, but very few other countries have. Britain and America have done a terrible job. Mm -hmm. But some people would argue that digitalization even makes the rift bigger because the, the complexity goes on and on, and uh, it's very difficult to bring educate people in that way as you want to have educate them. I think um, the, the fears of a, a sort of technology future in which we all get made redundant, I think are greatly exaggerated and, and actually wrong. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, uh, for example, um, if there were a robot sitting where you are trying to interview me, mm -hmm. um, it would not do a very good job, no matter how well it was programmed, and people wouldn't want to listen. Right? Nor would they want to listen if in place of me there was a robot. Right? Two robots talking to each other would not be good television. Right? Um, so you're and not there afraid are a whole load of jobs, yeah. a whole load of jobs uh, that depend upon human contact. But doing that is quite a skill. Your job is very skilled, so is mine, right? But there are skills that you can't teach a robot. So you're not afraid that robots will even more make this rift between educated and not No, educated I think they'll get more. rid of some of the very tedious rubbish. Um, but what they'll leave uh, is activities which can be very enriching. Right? Uh. Your book is called in German The Social Capitalism, and that reminds me in a way uh, of the notion of the social market economy, which was very popular in Europe, especially mm. in Germany, but also mm. in Switzerland. So do you want to re-establish this uh, social market economy? Well, I, I'm hesitant to describe anything as re. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to return mm -hmm. to something. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to take us back to the past. Um, every time capitalism derails, and it does so periodically, it has done now, it derails in a different way. There are new anxieties. That's why in English the subtitle of the book is called Facing the New Anxieties. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm a pragmatist. I believe always you've got to look at what's the context now, what are the anxieties now, and work out how best you can address them. And what you do will work for a while. There's no permanent utopian solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not an ideologue. Um, because you say um, capitalism has a problem, but it's also the fix of the problem. I mean, you don't, you're not in favor of abolishing uh, capitalism or something like that. Very much not, right? We've, we've, capitalism has been around for about 250 years. Um, human civilization has been around for about 10,000 years. Capitalism, this last 250 years, is the only system we've ever hit on that is capable of sustaining um, improvements in human life. And, um, and it's done so dramatically. Right? Um, the genius of capitalism, which is firms that are able to, big enough to reap scale economies and specialization, but subject to the discipline of competition, and so that decisions are taken in a decentralized way around firms, that's the one system that seems to work. For 10,000 years, we tried decentralization to households for production. We remained for 10,000 years very poor because we couldn't harness scale and specialization. And then for 70 years, we tried the totally centralized system, all decisions taken at the center, communism, 
that didn't work either. So we've got a system that works, but it doesn't work on autopilot. You can't just leave it to run, and uh, that's what some of the ideologues on the right believe, mm -hmm. uh, that all we need to do is get government out of the way less and everything will be less fine. Very cool. And that is just plain wrong. Mm -hmm. Any well-educated economist can tell you there are a lot of respects in which markets don't work. One respect um, is, is labor, labor training, the accumulation of skills. The market won't do that. The market will lead firms to poach. Switzerland's done a really good job of getting round that market failure. Britain's done a terrible job. Mm -hmm. So we need capitalism, but we have to improve it, we have to fix it. What would be the most important thing now to do? Well, I think two things. So one is to get firms back to being morally load-bearing. We need firms to be ethically responsible. Firms and families in their own different domains. And what has happened over the last 40 years is that moral responsibility has been stripped away from ordinary people, households and firms and moved up to the level of the state. So the state becomes the only moral actor. This is the utilitarian nightmare of a few saints at the top of society bossing the rest of us around because the, the economics in its crazy model of human behavior has this character called economic man who is greedy, selfish, and lazy. Mm -hmm. huh? That's true of about 3% of the population, but the other 97% of us are actually normal human beings who are capable, uh, have some appetite for bearing obligations, especially if they're reciprocal, if they're mutual. I will accept obligations against you if you accept them against me. And that's what social democracy and social market is, that building of reciprocal obligations in society. Firms have responsibilities not just to their share shareholders, but to their workforce, and to their community. Families have obligations to each other and especially to their children and the elderly. And these systems are vital. The state cannot substitute for them. The state can't rear children. The state can't regulate and micromanage firms that are unethical. Firms have to become ethically load-bearing. And can we force them to be ethical again? Isn't we can it a permit little bit them naive? We can permit them to be. At, at the moment, in British law, um, firms are really not allowed to be. The directors of companies are told that, that, that their legal liability is only to the shareholders of the company. And the shareholders in Britain um, are completely anonymous because they're dispersed around capital markets. And so, um, the shareholders never get involved in the management. Um, and so, really, these, these managers are just uh, on their own, desperate to try and keep quarterly profits rising. Otherwise, the shares are dumped and they're taken over. Um, but that's a very, very poor discipline. So we have to change laws? We have to change laws. Um, we have to get back to what corporations were for most of their 2,000 year history, and that is their systems of purpose. C coming out of Davos this year was a commitment to purpose. I, I was very proud to get a, a, a letter from Klaus Schwab, Schwab, Schwab saying, I've read The Future of Capitalism, I think it's the best book I've read for years, and this is what Davos is now doing, purpose in business. Right? Purpose is important and also inclusion, uh, you say. But uh, what do you mean by including people? What, what does that mean in a practical way? Yeah, so you can think of it as the big we. Um, and more we, less I. Uh, it, absolutely. More we, but, but an inclusive we. Um, so the, 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 det the detour of the last 40 years into self, self-fulfillment, right, personal achievement, that, I think, is an aberration. Um, uh, one, of my, one of the little bits of uh, social psychology that I really appreciate is a survey 
uh, which asks people, what are your big three regrets in life? And they can then cluster them. And if we were all selfish individuals, the big three regrets would be, if only I'd got that job at Goldman Sachs, if only I'd, you know, they don't feature. Um, all the big three regrets are of the form, I let my mother down, I let my colleagues down, I let my friends down. They're cases where we regret having breached obligations. Right? So we're naturally morally load-bearing. So partly we've had that detour individualism, but we've also had a, a, a really <coughs> horrible detour into what is described as nationalism but isn't. Um, nationalism before fascism was very clear. It, would, it included everybody in the nation. Mm -hmm. Whoever was in the nation should feel patriotic about the nation. Right? And nowadays, nationalism has been hijacked by a bunch of people who don't mean the big we of everybody in the nation. They mean we're the nation and you're not. But uh, even in Switzerland, you said Switzerland had made a, a, a great job in a way. But even in Switzerland, we have here the direct democracy. But even here, we have a rift between cities and rural areas. So if the notion of inclusion doesn't really work, even in Switzerland, would it work in, in say, in, in USA or in Great Britain, where the countries are much bigger? I think um, it's, it's not that complex, either what we need to do or how to do it. What we need to do is have a humane form of globalization in which we take productivity to people as near as possible to where they feel they belong. So instead of moving people to productivity in the big cities, we need to move productivity to people. Right? Every region needs to have a, a city which is productive where people can get worthwhile productive jobs and that is perfectly feasible. The fact that it doesn't happen automatically is because of a market failure mm -hmm. of capitalism. The market failure is that modern productive centers face a big coordination problem. Mm -hmm. I, my firm will go into this city if I believe that your firm will go into this city. So everybody goes into the city. Yes, mm -hmm. if we believe that it's the future. Mm -hmm. right? So um, what decides these things is very often um, narratives that circulate in a group. Um, you know, drag is narrative, whatever it takes, mm -hmm. was enough to stabilize the euro. Um, for many years, people accepted the narrative, um, the future is the big East Asian cities. Singapore is the city of the future. And so firms coordinated on investing in Singapore, and it became self-fulfilling. Right? Um, but these, this peculiar property that these narratives, are, uh, spatial narratives are self-fulfilling, we need to, to get some political commitments that say, we will do whatever it takes to ensure that each region has a city which is productive, which has these clusters of knowledge intensive firms, which brings together the local universities, the local business community and the local government um, so that they work together to create these clusters. Mm -hmm. For example, in Britain, Edinburgh um, is a, the one city in Britain other than London which has got productivity above the national average. Mm -hmm. right? And how have they done it? Because uniquely in Britain, Edinburgh has a lot of local autonomy in its government, thanks to Scottish nationalism. Uh, it's also got uniquely a local business community that functions as a community, thanks to it being the capital of Scotland. There's a Scottish business community. And it's also got two very good universities that over the last 50 years have worked with local government and with local business, training the, the workforce for the local businesses, doing research that keeps those local businesses at the cutting edge. Ten years ago, the local government, the universities, and the business community came together to say, we want to attract a new center to Edinburgh, a new activity, mm -hmm. and they chose IT. When they started, they'd only got two firms. They've now got 480. It's the biggest IT cluster in Europe. So 
purposive action at that coordinated level can work, can work well. So coordination is important, Vital. a big task that's why, for government. That's why the market doesn't do it, because yeah. the market can't coordinate can't, that. Yeah, the market can't do every, anything, but everything. But um, you also say we have to introduce new taxes. What do you mean by new taxes? Yes. What new taxes? This might hurt, um, because getting these clusters established around a country, although it indeed is inclusive, it brings people product, the ability to be productive. What we should be transferring is not just consumption subsidies, but we should be transferring the dignity of being capable of being productive where you live. Right? But that costs money. Right? That costs money. Because you'll need infrastructure, all the rest of it. Um, where's that money coming from? It's coming from the, the hyper-successful metropolises. Mm -hmm. And um, So you tax them. You do. The high, you do. highly you successful, do. highly educated. That's right. And, you, and, and the, 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 uh, the people who own land and property in the metropolis, because typically mm -hmm. they've seen huge capital appreciations um, in, the, in the value of their assets, um, which they haven't earned. Mm -hmm. But then some people say, oh, these highly educated people, they go then from London to Switzerland, or they go from Zurich to Frankfurt or to Paris, they leave the country and then we, can't, we cannot tax them. Um, to some extent, it depends how much you tax and it depends whether uh, all the metropolises start to do this. Um, you know, um, uh, New York taxes its, uh, its high income people, um, they pay 8% higher income tax. Um, than if they were in Minneapolis. Um, uh, but people are still in New York because it's a very productive cluster. There are what economists call uh, economic rents of agglomeration. And those economic rents of agglomeration really belong to the whole country because the whole country has made these metropolises successful. London is successful because of two or three hundred years of investment in London. Um, and so it's perfectly reasonable that the whole country should get some of the, the gains from, from these rents of agglomeration. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, those rents are being captured by the people who own the land in London, the people who own property in London, and the people who are highly skilled <laughs> and, and get jobs there. And there is another concept which is important with you, it's identity. Why is identity, what has identity to do with capitalism? So, let's, let's work backwards. Firms need purpose. People need purpose. The idea that we are just greedy, selfish, lazy consumers is a complete misunderstanding of what a human being is. We are all purposive. Huh? What defines that? Where do we get our notion of, of our purposes? We get our notion of purposes from the roles that we think of ourselves as playing. You know, we, we all have several roles. I think of myself as a father, as a professor. Each of those roles comes with a purpose, but it's, that role is a group identity, right? And, uh, and so all of us crave for a sense of belonging to something larger than our individual selves. And we get that through these group identities some of which are spatial groups. I grew up in Sheffield. I think of myself that home. Um, uh, I, so there's a spatial identity. There's a, an identity of a, of a role, the father, the professor. And these, so it goes from identity to roles, to roles, to purpose. Purpose is what drives us. And, uh, and so, Economics has seriously, seriously misunderstood what human beings are about. We're not just there to be lazy and consume. You know, there are one or two billionaires idle their lives away on boats, but I know quite a few billionaires. They're all purpose-driven workaholics, in my experience. They're not trying to make another billion. Mm -hmm. They're trying to do something that is larger than themselves. You are much in favor of pragmatism. You say pragmatism is important. But can pragmatism save capitalism? Yes, it can. Let me explain what I mean by, capital, by pragmatism. And it's, a, it's a, 
a philosophy that has very deep roots, going back to Hume, Smith, and then the big American philosophers, uh, James, Dewey, in the late 19th century. So it's a long philosophical tradition. And what pragmatism says is that our enemy is ideology. Mm. And ideology is, here's this book which describes how to get to utopia, and it's always and everywhere applicable. It's Karl Marx. Eh? It's the Bible, it's the Koran, it, whatever it is, right? There's utopia, here's the guide. Eh? Mm. They're really dangerous. Eh? Um, society isn't destined for utopia. There is no utopia. Right? Society is on a, on a, a sort of unpredictable path um, which periodically gets us into difficulties. And then we need to study the context and try and understand what is likely to work best here, recognizing that we don't know everything. And so quite a good idea is usually to experiment and learn. Mm -hmm. So life is a journey of social learning. That's pragmatism. Right? Uh, and so that seems step to me, by step, step by learning seems step very step. realistic, right? Um, pragmatism is not short-term populism. Right? Pragmatism requires a strategy to fix the new anxieties, whatever they are, at any one time. Um, and that strategy has to be the best you can do given what you know about the context now. Right? But pragmatism isn't pragmatism difficult in times of social media? Because politicians who are ideologues or uh, have poll positions, they get much more attention nowadays with the social media. And pragmatic politicians don't get the attention they perhaps um, earn. So what can be done about that? Um, don't forget you're speaking to a Briton. And uh, Britain is currently being captured by two small gangs of ideologues. Yeah. Um, we have the ideologues of the right who believe in the unregulated market. They're a tiny group of the population, but they happen to be a majority. The, 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 we are ruled at the moment in Britain by 1% of the population. Mm -hmm. It's the 1% of the population which has joined the two political parties and has voting rights. The other 99% of us think that the two political parties are sufficiently crazy that we don't want to be a member of them. Right? The Conservative Party at the moment, the ideologues rule the party because they have a majority of the little group of people who are mainly geriatrics who are uh, members of the Conservative Party. Similarly, on the Labour Party, the Labour Party is controlled by a bunch of Leninists. Mm. Why, where do they get their power? Because the tiny group of people who are members of the Labour Party are dominated by what we might call youthful idiots. You will remember the, the technical Marxist term, useful idiots. And Mr. Corbyn's one innovation has been to realize that in Britain, the useful idiots are youth. So. Both parties are, are captured, by captured by ideologues. And, um, and it's a nightmare. What, what we will see today, when it's quite a historic day, um, is mutinies in Parliament. Mm -hmm. Because for the first time, members of Parliament have taken control of the agenda off the government. Um, and that means the sane middle ground have taken power off the ideologues, mm -hmm. but only for the day. And what will happen with the Brexit then, if the uh, Parliament take back control? I'm not a... Uh, economists are really very, very bad at forecasting yeah. in the economy, let alone politics, right? Um, what I hope will happen and think might happen, um, uh, I think the, the one thing that it's possible to agree on, not much is possible to be agreed on at the moment, given this, the polarized state of the country, the one thing we could agree on is that we need to get back into a position of influence in Europe. Um, and uh, we can do that by unilaterally revoking Article 50. 
Article 50 was designed by a top British civil servant many years ago, basically to make it impossible to leave. Mm -hmm. um, because once you've revoked Article 50, you are in only one position, namely on your knees. Um, and Britain has found itself on our knees for the last two years. And, um, and, and so the first step is to revoke Article 50, get back into an equal basis of negotiation, and then see what we can do. And will pragmatic politicians take back control again? Well, they have done today. Um, let's see where it leads. OK, to get back where we started, to if we improve capitalism with your ideas, would your cousin had a better life? Yes, very much so. Because one of the big concepts in the book is what I call social maternalism. And it takes us from the birth of a baby through to, let's say, a 24-year-old young person who's equipped with skills and with a sense of ethical responsibility so that they're capable of contributing to society and want to contribute to society. Let's think of all the way along that chain from the babyhood to the 24-year-old, right? And it's a long chain with a lot of people and entities involved. At the start is the family. The first two and a half years is entirely up to the family. And if the family is unstable, then the child has a bad life, mm. a bad start in life. At the moment, in a lot of societies, we do very little to shore up families, to stabilize families. The, what I contrast social maternalism with is social paternalism, which is the bullying state, the state that takes young babies off their parents and that sort of thing. So we need to get back to really supporting young families in this very stressful phase of, you know, I remember my two-year-olds, my goodness, they're hard, right? They're hard even when you're equipped with all the, the money and the skills of patience and maturity. They're very hard when you're young people dealing with two two-year-olds or something, you know? Then you get to age two and a half to five, and the best place for a toddler of that age is to get them into a simple form of schooling. And France does this very well with Ecole Maternelle. Britain is a complete mess, right? The genius of Ecole Maternelle, because they're free, they're standard, everybody goes. Because everybody goes, the children of the poorest go as well. And then we get to schooling. And the, the world's best is Finland. Finland has done exactly the opposite of what Britain and most countries have done. Britain, Finland has decentralized the power of decision to the teachers. The teachers are empowered. They're trusted. And so are the children. The children are not test, 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 test. They're only tested at the end. In Britain, we've done exactly the opposite. We've got very detailed top-down instructions for what teachers have to do. And they're measured and monitored and incentivized. And the children are measured and monitored. And then at the end of the day, we look at the PISA scores when the children are finished, and, and, and Finland is right up there with Singapore as best in the world, and Britain is very poor. And then finally, when they're out of school, vocational training. And the best in the world is Switzerland, mm -hmm. where you've done a brilliant job. You've, still, you've got one of the world's top 10 universities, mm -hmm. but 60% of the Swiss choose not to go to university, they take the vocational training route, which is as prestigious, as good. You can become super productive through that route. Britain, we've got three of the top 10 universities. We're brilliant at the, at the top end. And for the other 60% of the population, we are, we're, we're a disgrace. So that, if that social maternalism chain had been in place, my cousin would have had a very different life. And how optimistic are you that your ideas can be put into practice, that something happens, that uh, the s capitalist societies will change in the next years? Yes, yes, quite a lot has happened. I've, I've, I've just completed a, 
a British Academy lecture to around provincial Britain. So I got a very good sense of, of how people are reacting to these ideas. <coughs> and there's, there's two striking things. One is the amount of pushback of opposition is absolutely minimal. Mm -hmm. The only opposition I'm getting mm -hmm. is from the extreme political right and the extreme political left, both of whom denounced me. Because the extreme political right wants to just leave capitalism alone on autopilot, mm -hmm. and the extreme political left wants to smash capitalism. They're united in opposition to me. I'm rather proud of that. Um, but other than that, for example, in the business community, I'm getting no pushback, none. Huh? Um, so that's one thing. The other is there is a groundswell from ordinary citizens saying, we can do this. We want to get back to purpose. In our jobs, we want to get back to purpose. In our community, we want to get back to purpose. And amazing things are actually happening with social enterprise, um, purposive things that people are doing. And so there is a, a natural, very strong appetite to put things right. That's from the bottom. And finally, from the top, the politicians, the first political party to embrace this will win and will stay in power for a long time. And so there's quite a big incentive for the politicians to come round. You watch, they're actually already doing it. I'm in touch with a lot of them around Europe. And there's appetite. So I'm quite hopeful. Thank you very much, Paul Collier, for this interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.